integrated graphics are always a point of contention for people looking to get into PCs. But now, with one of the more recent AMD chips I've got on test, it seems we're finally seeing them match old flagships in packages that hardly break using more than 30 watts. Now thanks to GCOM who have sent over their new budget mini PC for me to test out with one of the newer AMD APU systems inside. I know these will be retailing for about $499, I think they've got a few sales on or some coming up and there will be links down in the description below in case anyone is interested in going out and actually getting one of these. So why don't we get this opened and get on with the rest of the video. Right why don't we get this thing open and actually take a little look at what's inside the box. So this is the mini PC A6. It's got a Ryzen 7 6800H, 32 gigs of DDR5, and a one terabyte M2 SSD. Now I know it's their budget model, so it makes sense why they're sending it to me. And to be fair, I still use the mini PC that they actually sent me last time because it's actually a really good bit of kit. And GCOM, thankfully, let me do mostly whatever I'd like with these, which is nice. So why don't we get this open, see what you actually get. Get that off there. Will that now open? Yes, it will. Ooh. So we get inside, we get one mini PC. Very mini PC. This thing's tiny. Look at that. I love these little things. Look, that is literally smaller than my hand. Right, so we got the mini PC, little owner's manual, and we got all the kit in the bottom. And we got the power adapter, HDMI cable. That looks to be a VESA mount. This thing is minuscule, but what I'm more curious about is to plug it in. You know, they asked me to take a look at the budget model and to let you guys know how it performs, so they've clearly got high hopes for it. But uh, let's go take this, plug it in, and see what we can do with it. While we're getting this all set up though, just what are the specs of this GCOM A6? Just so we actually know what we've got on test. Now the CPU is actually an AMD Zen 3 based processor which is the Ryzen 7 6800H and it's my first experience using one of these. It released a couple of years ago now in 2022 but it was relatively high end and actually matched some of Intel's Core i7s so processing power wise we've got plenty of power there. It's also got a Radeon 680M integrated graphics card which is something that actually got me curious about this because I love seeing just how far they've come with integrated graphics. Paired with this we've also got 32GB of speedy DDR5 which hopefully should be enough to actually act as competent VRAM and other than that you've also got 1TB of storage. So it's not half bad spec wise and definitely serves as a good base to find out just how far integrated graphics have come. Talking a little bit more about the graphics card as for some reason that's where my real fascination is and it's definitely a bit more modern than some of the usual cards we test here on the channel and it shows that things have certainly progressed. Most notable is the shader count here. It's somewhere between a HD7770, a card that we've heard and seen plenty of, and a HD7790, so think Xbox One tier level of shaders. Yet the performance, without spoiling things, well, it means that AMD is squeezing out a lot more performance today with that shader count than they were back in the GCN days. Actually getting things set up though, I mean this is a Zen 3 processor, and given the monumental leap this was over the original iteration of Zen processors, there wasn't a single issue with speed or actually getting it set up. I went in with a completely blank install and just whacked on everything we needed in no time. We had everything from MSI Afterburner through to Steam, and plenty of other bits with no hitches or slowdown. I mean, general usage isn't really an issue with anything that's from this decade, but you know, it's always nice to see that you can do something this quick while using such little power. So I was trying to think of something that could actually put some strain on a system like this and all I could think of was a bit of video editing. So I loaded up last week's video project and we rendered that out in 4K and these aren't light video projects and overall to render a 4K video at full tilt it took just under 15 minutes. It was actually 14 minutes and 32 seconds for those that really care and this really isn't software optimized for the modern day. I mean, it recommends a Pentium 4, yet here we are using it on Zen 3. So video editing wise, not a single problem. In fact, if you watched my video 
video on the Sandy Bridge i5-2400, you're actually viewing a copy that was rendered there. So yeah, video editing and virtually anything CPU intensive, we've already established that isn't a problem, because this is Zen 3 and thankfully it is really quite powerful. I didn't think it would always be so nice to use, but this thing is really punching dead high given that you can run quite CPU intensive tasks without a problem. Really though, what we all want to see is the benchmarks. Just how well is an AMD iGPU throwing its weight around in the modern world? I mean, this thing is a couple of years old now, and I have updated the benchmark suite again slightly for 2025, just so we can see how it's holding up in the real world of AAA in some of the most intensive and also some of the most popular titles out there. So hopefully things go well in the benchmarks. Starting off the benchmarks, we have Counter-Strike 2, which we were able to run with high settings throughout, and this was through the rather intensive benchmark, and we saw the graphic card working overtime here. But still, an admirable result that means you can play through the entire thing relatively competitively with all the eye candy turned on. Lowering things could give you a higher frame rate, but still, things were very smooth with them all turned on. Throughout both Red Dead Redemption 2 and its built-in benchmark, the game tended to hover around 30 to 40 FPS, even when things were getting rather intensive. Things looked great with most options set to medium and a few of the lighting and effect options actually turned up to high, and it made the game look really rather decent. Our iGPU was once again definitely working overtime, compared to the processor which had a bit more headroom, but still we're seeing flagship performance here, on par with Nvidia's GTX 780 and AMD's own HD 7970 in a tiny power envelope, which is where the real talking point is, because the HD 7970 was a great card, and now we're seeing it matched by iGPUs. Classic titles like GTA 5, you can pretty much whack everything up to high settings in 1080p and you'll never see under 60fps. It didn't matter how intensive things got, as the processor has so much headroom and so much spare utilisation that the frame times we saw were nearly perfect. Turning things up to Ultra might be doable, but we are still suffering with DDR5 memory bandwidth, which isn't as good as GDDR5 and onwards, but still, they can make the Ultra settings a bit more intensive than you'd expect but high settings all round isn't bad at all. Over in the world of online though, things also weren't too bad either. Rather than the usual 50% hit we've got used to seeing, we only saw a 20fps loss at the worst of times, leaving the game hovering around the 60fps mark. Fortunately, our GPU did maintain 100% utilisation here, so it's just the game and its strange optimizations at play here. But either way, from small lobbies up to ones that are packed out with over 16 players, the game mostly stuck around the high 50s in terms of frame rate and could go over 60 FPS in those smaller lobbies. Cyberpunk was the first game where we had to dabble in a little bit of FSR, which was set to the balance preset. We were still able to run the game in 1080p with medium settings and actually see a really playable frame rate with not a half bad looking game. This was the same during actual gameplay, so you've got no worries even running intensive titles. It was also the first time that the Ryzen processor actually saw over 50% utilisation, so still plenty in reserve, but it goes to show that these more modern games actually can utilise that Ryzen 7. But still, things looked alright, and that's the thing with FSR. It is there to help out in games where you might need it. A new one with Dragon Age Veilguard, which I've actually found to be really quite well optimised for such a new game. Even so, we did have to use FSR again, and did have to drop a few of the settings that were rather intensive down to low. Now, that doesn't look bad at all in a game like this, because genuinely, the game looks fine. I have no clue how to play this game whatsoever, but from what I did play, it actually ran quite well, and actually tended to stick between 40 to 60 FPS during the less intensive parts, and around the mid 30s when things were intense. So, you know, you can actually enjoy this game relatively well. The CPU was also being hammered quite a lot, it still had plenty of headroom, but still, it goes to show those AAA titles will run as long as you tweak your settings down a little bit. Baldur's Gate 3, on the other hand, really ran quite well with a good mixture of medium and high settings in 1080p, and we didn't need to rely on FSR here or anything to keep the FPS at a perfectly playable level. Usually in combat we would see 50 to 60 FPS, and in wider, more open areas where we're really taxing the DDR5 memory, the game could hover around the mid 30s, and would hitch slightly when loading cutscenes, but this really is a rather memory intensive game, and we're using it to run the game and to actually load it into our VRAM. 
but it's still a perfectly playable experience and one that looked good too. Danalore defaulted to the high preset, which I left the game on. We didn't need any resolution scaling or settings changed, the game just looked brilliant and I had no issues handling you know, even the largest of battles. The game tends to scale exceptionally well across multiple cores, and with plenty of RAM here too, it was probably one of the best experiences I've had playing the game. And you can handle the game right through to the end game with massive battles and you'll still get an excellent frame rate, thanks to how much headroom the processor has. And the graphics card, well, it handles the high preset absolutely fine. BeamNG here running with the medium preset and then a few of the options on high, and we saw a brilliant experience, even with the most intensive of maps. Generally, some of the more simpler maps saw well over 60 FPS, so it's only when you crank things up to the most intensive scenarios you really see things start to struggle at all. You can safely spawn in traffic and flood the camera with foliage and really just do whatever you want without the fear of the game dropping down to single digit frame rates, which is a nice thing to see in BeamNG. Next up was one that really showed that PUBG hasn't progressed much even in the world of optimization. I mean, we were able to achieve a relatively solid frame rate once we reached the ground, but getting there could involve a few hitches and stutters. I want to say it could be VRAM related, as when I've run this game before, it tends to struggle on most cards with slower VRAM. I mean, my old Fury with HBM actually ran this infinitely better than even some newer cards. But as it was, we did see a relatively okay experience when using the DirectX 12 renderer and medium settings. Bethesda's Fallout 4 actually ran alright too. I mean, once again, it wasn't a strange enough device to hit a constant 60fps, but we got close enough with our FPS staying in the high 50s, and this was with the high preset as well, so the game looked decent, and the good news is, our FPS didn't actually change too much depending on what we were doing. Cities, towns, wilderness combat, it wasn't a problem, just you won't be hitting that crucial 60fps mark all of the time. But that's more of an issue with Fallout 4 and its weird optimizations. But finally, can it run Crisis? Well, fortunately, with the game turned all the way up to ultra settings in 1080p, we managed to run the game with a perfectly adequate 70fps. Really a testament to that processor boosting up across two cores to rather high frequencies. I think it was hitting about 4.6 to 4.7 gigahertz here. So for those classic demanding titles, it generally runs them fantastic. I mean, imagine explaining to someone back when Crisis released that you're getting over 60 FPS in a device that you can hold in your hand using an iGPU, so not even a real graphics card, and you're hardly breaking 35 watts. It's pretty impressive and, you know, it's, it's brilliant. The fans didn't even ramp up because this thing is so understressed here. So overall in the benchmarks, I mean the performance for an iGPU, one that is at this point just over two years old, is remarkably decent. Genuinely, the idea that we're seeing HD 7970 performance from an efficiency focused part from AMD is astonishing, because I'm fairly sure anyone that remembers those cards releasing remembers they weren't exactly the coolest or most power efficient things in the world, especially when you got some of those versions that had upped clocks from the factory. But here we're seeing that level of performance and we don't even have dedicated VRAM. I mean, anything I threw at this seemed to work perfectly fine. Sure, for most of the more recent titles we did have to tweak some settings, but most games default to high settings and they run alright. And any older title, well, you can look at maxing them out. I mean, we were GPU bound in all instances, but at the end of the day, the GPU is a nice bonus to what is a powerful low-end processor. It's a strange way of wording it, but that's really how it is. The fact you just get the graphics card included with this processor and it runs that well. But don't you think I'm going to stop there? Nope, the next thing I wanted to see was just how scalable this weird AMD APU actually is. I mean, given the PC's form factor, one major appeal is going to whacking this next to a TV. But that doesn't mean your average 4K or 1080p telly, no. I was thinking the real challenge is can we make this PC display a decent 480i signal? And it turns out that yep, somewhere back in those AMD drivers, these things are full of so much legacy code that it can actually display a really decent quality 480i, that's interlaced signal. And even over my rather dubious adapter, I was able to fire up Fable the Lost Chapters and genuinely, for these older titles, you are able to max them out with no problems at all, enjoy a nice 60fps lock and have a properly decent retro gaming experience that makes games look brilliant 
with no problems and this is on a modern graphics card. I mean sure you might want to do some more scaling tweaks than I did but so far everything from the latest titles through to the older classics works fine in 480i. Some will require more tweaking than others but the fact you can do that is impressive. Now I did try and do a bit of synthetic testing just to see where the actual performance lies and some metrics for it. You know, coping with sustained loads and things like that. And across a few game tests, 3D Mark, Time Spy and bits like that, it does seem like the processor will boost up to around 4.3GHz sustained load, which is pretty decent, and it'll boost up to 4.7 and 4.8GHz when using just a couple of cores, which explains why this processor seems to handle older titles relatively well and in video editing some of those you know, single core focused effects, which is probably more an issue with my software, where it just powers through them by boosting a couple of cores. The main limit tends to be the thermal target, where the system wants to keep itself under 90 degrees, which I can safely say it will do, as even under a sustained heavy load, the system will run at a maximum of 89 degrees, and that is of course without really ramping up the fans. The GPU clocks are the first to drop, but given in most titles you tend to be limited by the speed of the VRAM anyway, you don't tend to notice that the frame rate's dropped. I mean, unless you were doing really sustained heavy workloads, you just aren't going to see a performance drop really at all. I did try and do some investigating into whether there was any difference when changing the system between gaming and productivity focus, and outside maybe one or two FPS in certain games, there really wasn't much of a difference. Generally I'd say whack it in game mode because there does seem to be a small advantage, but I did go back through and redo all of the benchmarks with this enabled just to see if it makes any difference, and it seems like it's mostly prioritising memory for the VRAM slightly more than it does in you know, the productivity focus mode, but Windows already does a relatively decent job at this and has done since Windows 7, but still it's a nice option to see in the AMD drivers and maybe in some tasks it'll make a bigger difference, but it's still a nice option to have. Size wise this thing is absolutely minuscule, the one thing GCOM did ask if I could do was talk about the build quality, and it genuinely is quite impressive how much power they've managed to cram into a very small box that stays cool and quiet even when running things like Red Dead 2 and just sips away at power when maxing out Crisis. Now I actually do a lot of editing on the higher end mini PC they sent me a while ago and that one is still going strong after quite a lot of heavy usage in a wide range of environments. And I mean they sent me some footage that I could use and they test these things on a wobble machine. I don't know what the wobble machine does, but look at it, you wouldn't get someone serious about their reliability throwing one of these things on the wobble machine. I want one just for testing stuff now, I don't even know what they do, but they've got a wobble machine. But really, I'm not the target audience for something like this. I mean, I usually build PCs, and to be fair, I do get why people want these, because I do use my other mini PC all the time, purely because the form factor is dead convenient for someone that just needs something they can plug and play with ease. I mean, when you've got to clear a desk for the next project, it's convenient that your entire computer can just be picked up in your hand rather than lugging around an entire desktop. So as much as these are a bit of a niche market, they certainly are convenient for someone that wants to plug and play things. So I gave it to my brother just to see how he gets on with it because he's been looking for a new computer, one that just sort of runs everything, and I wanted to get his thoughts on someone that you know, just wants a computer he can push an on button for. He doesn't want to build anything, he doesn't want to touch components, he just wants to push on and to have it work. I really like it. Small, compact, and it's easy. Easy to use. It seems to play the games I want to play, which my old computer couldn't. So I'm happy. And it has a lot of space on it. It's like, you know, a lot more space than my old computer. So that's always good. And a lot more than other consoles. And you can get a lot more games on it. Because all the other Xbox and PlayStation consoles, you're always, you've always got to have those games. Whereas this one, you can get any game you want on it. Which is pretty good. So there we have it. AMD's sort of new iGPU and Ryzen chip reviewed in the GCOM A6. I'd like to say a big thank you to GCOM for helping out and sending me this review sample, because otherwise we wouldn't get some of these more modern bits of tech here on the channel. That, and they let me test things on a CRT. You find me another sponsorship, there's as much faith in this channel, they'll know I'll make it work in 480i of all things. I hope you've all enjoyed seeing just how far this kind of technology has come. I mean, I still can't believe it myself. HD 7970 performance that you can fit in your pocket. That seems like insanity to me. Hope you've all enjoyed watching this video. Thank you very much for watching, and good night.